how do I go about, uh, you know, doing treatments in a post-COVID world? And the problem with that is, is as I mentioned, there's no, there's no set formula for this. And so we've spent a lot of time now just pulling together a lot of information. Uh, I said to someone a while ago, you know, you know, we, 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 we have a lot of expertise. We're experts in lasers, but we're not experts necessarily in viral transmission. And so we've had to call upon expertise elsewhere to help us push this together. And what we're going to do today then is really present to you uh, an overview of two significant documents that we've produced. Hey, Liz worked incredibly hard on this and uh, Andy Berry and, and a few of us at, at LinkedIn. And these two documents we think will pr provide clinics and particular our customers with huge amount of valuable information and guidance on what to do. But, but that, that's what it is, it is guidance. At the end of the day, you know, it's the responsibility for the person who owns a clinic um, to put into place the right procedures and policies. This is just guidance. And as things unfold, you know, new information comes to light, things may change as well. So there's a, a clear date on this, because this is the best guidance we can offer as of today, but that might change as we move forwards. So I suppose it's worth mentioning at this point, that these documents that we're going to talk through now, we're going to jump in and out of this presentation and look at the actual documents. And this presentation really just highlights key points. But they will be available for people to download from our website. Hayley, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So on our website, there's now a, um, there's a resources section just on our website and I'll send everybody the link for this so you don't have to remember it. I'll drop it into the chat as well in a moment. But on our main website, you just go to resources and then there's a section now which is um, reopening, tools for reopening. And um, we'll be continuously dropping new documents in there over the next few weeks. So it's worth just coming back and checking on it regularly. But I'll send everybody the link for that so that you've all got access to these documents. And I think that's the key point that I'm making here is that, that these things will, will be working documents. They will uh, change over time or potentially change over time. So we'll give them versions and you'll be able to just check you've got the latest version because there may be amendments as, as we go along. I think the other thing to mention just at this point is that in, in no respect to we dictating when people should open. Um, government guidance is currently such that you know, it doesn't specifically name aesthetic clinics. Uh, it depends where you feel you may sit in this. But I would say there's general consensus in our industry at the moment that most aesthetic practices wouldn't open until at least the 4th of July, which is a date that's been indicated by government for things like hair salons, hairdressers, beauty salons to, could reopen. Places essentially where you've got to be close up to your customers, your clients or, or, your, or your patients. So, um, you know, just from our point of view, our clinic is planning to open around the 4th of July or thereafter, but um, we, will, we will just follow government guidance as and when that's, that's given to us. And likewise, all the guidance we give you today in this presentation and in these documents, it's obviously not to supersede anything that government says. Government guidance and, and uh, health and safety would always take precedent over anything we say, but we've tried to fit our documents around that any, anyway. Yeah, John, it's worth um, discussing here Wales. Um, now, Wales haven't given a specific date, have they? So, it's a really good point. Yeah, sorry. The wiser for Wales. Yeah, yeah uh, it is that this is England actually. That's absolutely mm. spot on. Uh, and obviously, you'd have to follow your local legislation and um, I know in Wales, yes, I don't know the situation in Wales in terms of the date yet, um, but you, you are governed, of course, by um, HIW in Wales, so they would be someone you could consult on that, perhaps, for guidance if you needed to. I guess that would help. But other than that, of course, the, the, just the Welsh Assembly, same in Scotland, of course. Yeah, if, if anyone in the audience has heard anything from um, HIW, then it's worth uh, mentioning, mentioning that in the chat, but... Uh, yeah, and Scotland as well, roughly mid-August, so. Okay, yeah. I mean, certainly July 4th is like the earliest date I would um, imagine possible from what the, in the government for England um, are saying for England. So, uh, you know, late later than that, 
wouldn't surprise me. It depends on how things uh, unfold as we come out of lockdown, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we're thinking about preparing, uh, although the date might be uncertain, we can still make preparations, of course, and we've got um, information that we want to present on that. I guess it's worth saying, you know, how our thought process has gone here. We, we started um, essentially looking at the government guidance for returning to work. We, we have offices, of course, we've got to prepare, and there's some clear guidance on how to uh, implement various um, various policies, procedures, and physical things to, to minimise the risk of COVID transmission uh, in the workplace. And if you go on to the web link that's shown here, you can, you can get all this information. Um, but of course, there's nothing specific for clinics, for aesthetic practices. So what we've essentially done is taken these five steps that the government recommend for any workplace, and then tried to translate these steps through into what would be relevant for a clinic. And of course, you know, that's where our own judgment comes in and the work we've done, uh, um, you know, with uh, uh, gathering a lot of information from a lot of experts. So there's five steps that we're going to step through really in this, pre this presentation now. We'll jump about slightly and we'll make them relevant for clinics. Um, but the first step that you see here is carry out a risk assessment. There's obviously things like hand washing, hygiene, social distancing. And the problem with that is when you get into a treatment room and you're treating a client, social distancing is, is incredibly, well, it's, it's impossible to maintain. And so at that point, that's where you have to take other steps, largely through the PPE, protective personal equipment. Um, and that kicks in because social distancing cannot, cannot be uh, used. And then of course, uh, the last bit of guidance we're gonna give is where you can work at home, you should work at home. The problem for clinics, of course, is we can't deliver treatment remotely to people. We've got to be up close. Uh, to do that. So these five steps have guided us to producing two key documents, the first of which is a, a risk assessment. Um, we've used this risk assessment in our own clinic um, and this is a, a, the sort of format of the risk assessment is a standard government uh, recommendation. We've obviously then applied specific scenarios, hazards to, um, to, to clinic environments and come up with some solutions. Now, this does of course depend specifically on your environment. We can be generic, we can give good guidance, there's great information in this document, but you would have to step through this in your own practices, uh, your own environments, and make appropriate adjustments. But essentially, it, here's a risk assessment we've produced and we're gonna talk in more detail about that. Uh, the other document we've produced, we're calling the reopening uh, checklist, and that just steps you through a sequence of very high level summary bullet points or sort of the sorts of policies or procedures you could implement in your clinic environment to again minimize the risk of uh, COVID transmission during uh, treatments and the, the whole clinic experience in actual fact. So during this presentation, we're going to jump out of the presentation. Hayley's going to present some of these documents on screen, and we're actually going to look in a bit more detail and talk, talk through some of that. And these are the two documents, amongst others, that will be available on the website as well. So it's these five points that we're going to talk through, uh, and, and we'll run through during the uh, presentation now. So if we have a think about doing a risk assessment in a clinic, I think the important thing to know, uh, and I'm sure you've all done your homework, you've all done it, but I'll just sort of summarise a little bit about COVID transmission. And you've got to consider this. I think it's important to have some, some understanding as much as possible. Um, if you're doing a risk assessment, you've got to bear in mind how would these things, how would COVID be transmitted? What, what are the mechanisms? And that really informs your risk assessment, how you can, because what you're trying to do essentially is mitigate, minimise these hazards, minimise the risk, of transmission through whatever means. Now, the problem I found in doing this, and sure other people have as well, is you know COVID's a new, a new uh, virus, and not all the information is available. And there was a lot, there's lots of, I found a lot of misinformation on the internet, a lot of speculation as well. I've taken a lot of the information we've got here from the NHS, uh, and it's, it's as good as I think most people are aware of at this stage. Um, COVID-19 is very similar to other viruses in the past, like SARS, so we have got a lot of information on 
previous viruses that have informed what uh, most people consider to be the transmission of COVID. So what we do know about COVID transmission is uh, it's to do with viral load. And my understanding of that is it's not just about coming into contact with the virus itself. But it's also to do with the sort of quantity of virus you, uh, you will come into contact with. And that can depend a lot on the time you're in that vicinity. So it's a, it, infection risk can increase the longer you're in contact with somebody who might be COVID uh, positive. Um, the, the people know that the main form of transmission is through sort of droplets or contact. So uh, you'll be fully aware, I'm sure, that this is a, a respiratory disease. And so if it, you know, the, the virus is held within the respiratory tract, if you cough, if you sneeze, you, you're projecting uh, particles through the atmosphere and that can contain the virus. And, that, and that's believed to be the main form of transmission. People do say it can be transmitted directly or indirectly through contact as well. Although I understand that to be a, a lesser effect, it's still something that has to be uh, you know, considered um, very seriously. So, that, so the main sort of transmission, as we said before, someone might sneeze or uh, cough. And then the way that gets into your body is through in your mouth or eyes or nose. So just touching something that's infected, of course, on its own wouldn't just, you know, you wouldn't catch COVID by, by that alone. You'd have to then put your hands in your mouth or rub your eyes and that's how it gets, it gets into your body. Um, that's why, of course, the, one of the main uh, ways to be safe is to regularly wash your hands because that will prevent you, you, you know, if you have touched something, actually contracting the disease. Um, if it's believed when COVID is outside the body and it's on a surface, it can be maintained on the surface for quite a significant time. Many viruses can't last very long at all outside the body. It's thought that COVID can. And people suggest that 72 hours is the minimum time that you would be uh, required to leave something to ensure that COVID, the COVID virus had, had eventually died off. So it can exist on surfaces quite a significant amount of time as well. So the, the main transmission, coughing, sneezing, you know, uh, saliva, you then breathe that in or somebody touches something, they infect it, you touch it and then somehow you put your hands in your mouth and your eyes. They're the main ways that this uh, virus would be transmitted. So if we're thinking about how to minimize that risk when we reopen our clinics, then the best way to approach that and the way the government recommends us to approach that is step one, to take a risk analysis and step through your own your clinic and consider how you would minimize the risks of transmission based on what we've just discussed there, the ways that this could be transmitted. And here's a risk, the risk assessment template that um, the government recommends to use you identify a hazard, you consider um, who that could affect, and um, maybe you've already got controls in place for that, that's fine. But if not, is there anything additional you need to do? Uh, and then with any action plan, you know, who's going to do that and by when would that be carried out? And then a little tick at the end and it's all done and dusted. And I think at this point, um, we're going to jump over to Hayley and actually pull up the risk assessment, aren't we? Um, yeah. I'll just stop. So you should be able to see this now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is our example risk assessment, and, and everybody attending can get a copy of this. Um, and it, it it run shall we run through sort of a across the top and along the bottom, yep. Yeah. Okay, so if you take one general hazard, you've got contaminated surfaces. So that's the hazard, the contaminated surface. Who might be harmed and how? Well, this could be anyone really, couldn't it? Any staff member or any client or any visitor to the business um, that can contact, contract the virus by touching that contaminated surface. So you've just got to think really simply, okay, what's the hazard? Think about those contact areas, you know, the coughs and the sneezes, etc. And you just do a, a sort of a general walkthrough of those things, asking yourself these questions as you go. 
So what are you already doing to control the risk of that? Well, you're already doing, I'm sure, weekly or daily cleaning services. But then this is the bit where you start to bullet point in any additional things that you can do in order to avoid or control the risk. So ensure that all staff have access to soap and hot water hand washing facilities in washrooms, bathrooms, toilets, etc. Discourage the use of your washrooms by clients. So as you can see, this, this goes through quite in depth, some general hazards to begin with. Okay, and there'll be general ones that you're all going to be able, hopefully, to just cut and paste for your businesses because they are general aesthetic clinic hazards. You'll need to obviously fill in, you know, who's who needs to carry out the action. So who's going to do that? When is that action needed by and is it done? Yes or no. Now, the beauty of a document like this is that you can split it up then into very specific hazards. Um, so, for example, we've now got. Um, the reception and the waiting rooms. So the way that we've done it is we've done sort of our general hazards and then we've broken it down into the different areas of the business. So we've done the reception area, the kitchen, the toilets, the treatment room and the treatment itself. And the great thing about this is once you've actually done this and you've gone through each room and had to think about the hazards that are there and how you're going to deal with them, that actually then allows you to just roll this information into policies and procedures. So um, the bulk of the work in creating the policies and procedures are already done in effect by the time you've gone through a really thorough risk assessment like this. Any questions so far on risk assessment? Should we take a break there and no. just see if anyone's... Just have okay. a quick look through, no, I think... Might work, I mean... For me, I think we've got at our clinic a selection of rooms, and we have a staff room a place for people to make food and so on. But I guess most clinics, the key areas are going to be the reception waiting area and then through to a treatment room, I imagine. I know we're going to come on a bit more detail to treatment rooms and treatments uh, in a moment. But what about a reception room, hey? What, what, are the, what would be your top five things that you're thinking here? Well, let me go to my risk assessment, John, and tell you. <laughs> so, I mean, the biggest thing with receptions is just controlling the number of people that are in reception and how they actually get into it. So I think one of the things that, that we have the ability to do in our clinic is this first one, which is implement a text or a call system so that a client will wait outside, sat in the car. And so we don't actually need to worry about implementing social distancing in the waiting areas because we will just have one person at a time actually coming through the business and they won't be able to gain access until, you know, we, we give them that access. If you are working in a site where you've got multiple operators and there'll be multiple clients, then doing things like staggering those appointment times so that people are arriving at least sort of 15 minutes apart from each other um and you know having this sort of system where they they aren't allowed through the door until you you allow them to will will hopefully hopefully control that quite nicely um so, all sorts so, of things you can do in the reception room you know perspex screens if you do need to have more than one person in at a time and you can't do your two meter social distancing then using perspex screens and zoning out areas on the floor are all things that you might want to consider Good practice would be to try and avoid people waiting in the waiting room, essentially, isn't yeah. it? It's to, it's to schedule and leave gaps such that people arrive and, and, and literally go straight through into a treatment. Is, is that best sort of policy at the moment? Is that what most people are thinking? Yeah, where possible. Yeah, definitely. It depends on the, the, the number of people. And what we, what we have tried to do in our risk assessment here, although it's done for our clinic, we've tried to think about different clinics as well. So we've said things, for example, like where possible allow this to happen. But if not, this is an alternative. So you would just, you know, you could have a read through this and just think to yourself, you know, which of those options works best for me and implement those. Um, and that's not to say that we'll have thought of everything because I'm sure that we won't. Um, but, it, you know, hopefully it just gives you a good guide to, to start off with. So um, a couple of good questions here. You know, what about hand sanitizer when people come into the clinic? What are we recommending here? Uh, alcohol content, non-alcohol content, washing your hands. Yep. Okay, so 
all of that is covered in this risk assessment um, and also in our other document so shall we come back to that bit perhaps when we okay. start to go through that yeah but but that's all all good questions and all covered no problem and uh do here's a good one do, would you say that um all staff have to be trained in this risk assessment prior to opening uh, and, and yeah. sort of signed off you know do people have to be how would you recommend one of these uh, risk yeah. assessments? So in our guidance checklist, we have actually put in there um, a, a little checklist for you to say that you've issued your risk assessment to all team members, anyone who might be coming into the business, um, all, the, all your employees and your team members, and that you actually um, issue it almost as a first draft and get their opinion on it as well. So you, you, you know, it, they're a hugely useful resource your team they're going to read something in your risk assessment and think oh I'm not sure that's going to work they might have different ideas on things so definitely worth that and then I would um, have them I've, we've, we've put into our guidance to say to sign for your team to sign to say that they have actually received certain different training seminars that we recommend you run and that they thoroughly understand the risk assessment the policies and the procedures before they come back to work yeah, um, there is a question here about treatments on the face and masks, but I think we're going to come on to that, aren't we? Yeah, so, yeah, we're going to come so on we'll to come that. back to that. I, I mean, I, I like to add that. So myself and Andy Berry have been doing a lot of work at our head office, our, our home chapel sites, not just on the clinic but on the offices and the, and the factory as well. And I found it amazingly useful. You can do this risk assessment uh, as a desk exercise. You can imagine walking through your clinic. What would I do? There's nothing better than I'm actually going in with this document in your hand and stepping through that bit by bit. I, I did it with Andy. We, were, we kept our two metres distance, of course. Um, but it was really good because Andy had got some great ideas. We were talking about at this point in time, the factory and how that would be laid out. And we had some masking tape. We were literally masking lines on the floor. And it became apparent that what we both imagined would be easy to do became quite difficult. And we had to go, we had to reiterate that. And in the end, we came up with a different system of how we're going to mark our floors out. I think it's nothing better. You know, this isn't just a tick box exercise to do on the computer to say, I've done a risk assessment. Use this genuinely to walk through your clinic. Ideally, perhaps with someone to bounce some ideas off, a bit of masking tape on the floor, whatever it is you need to do and sc scribble on this. Because I'm, I'm no doubt that when you're in the actual situation and you're chatting about how, how is this really going to work, things change. And that's what this is about. This is about coming up with the best policy and system when you reopen the clinic. And, that, and I have no problem that when we actually reopen the clinic or we reopen the factory, uh, that we will find uh, things will change again. You know, and we will, we will listen to what people say. We will see how, things, you know, how clients arrive, how things move around. This, this can be something that's fluid and it changes as you go along. It doesn't have yeah. to be fixed, does it? Yeah. And, and so this risk assessment does cover um, not just cleaning and hygiene policies and, and additional risks that you might come across in terms of that, but it does go on to cover, you know, the treatment rooms in general and then also the treatment itself. So in here, we've got everything about, um, you know, the uniforms, the PPE, um, specifically, you know, laser specific PPE, which we'll come on to talk about uh, in a moment, uh, cleaning your machines, cleaning your equipment, smoke evacuators. So all of these things, you know, they are actions. If, if you implement any of these things, they're actions that you're taking against the increased hazard. So they're all listed within this, this one document that you start with. And then, as John says, it's, it's easy. If you do this in real life, you walk through your clinic, maybe you even do the cleaning. I mean, we were talking earlier, weren't we, John, about how you know, if you really, if you're going to write a list as to how to how to decontaminate the toilets, you, know, you probably want to actually get in there and see exactly which surfaces you know you need to have written down into that policy for your decontamination uh, toilet policy. Go through it, and then once this is done, this is the hard work, really, isn't it? And everything else is uh, can be created off the back of this document. Let's just jump to a good idea, and, as, and that is, you know, before you actually reopen to clients, uh, bring in the team and let them walk through this with you as well. Uh, and, and you'll get even better feedback, I'm quite sure. So great idea. Okay, let me go back to 
we jump back into the presentation here. Okay, so that, that's a risk assessment. It's available. Re remember that there's some great information in there, but it has to be, you need to look at your own environment and, and amend it. Uh, we're here to support you do that, of course, if you need any help. And this document is, is freely available uh, from the website. Okay, so tip number one on our five point plan, we've carried out our risk assessment now. We've talked to people uh, about results, potentially even got, it, got people involved in, in amending it. I think the important thing now is to start thinking, okay, well, how are we going to mitigate? That's a risk assessment. What are we doing in practice? What are we actually putting in place in terms of our policies, our procedures, physically changing the building or changing the way we do things. And we're going to link lump these things together with it. Points two, three, and four, I think, are, 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 should be taken holistically. We, we've looked at these in round, and we're going to cover them now in our document, because what we've got here really is uh, our second document deals with the clinic, the different areas of the clinic, and all of these, these next three points together. So the next three points is, is basically think of it like hygiene. You know, how is hygiene implemented, hand washing, so on. How is social distancing implemented? So outside the treatment room, your, your primary defense against COVID transmission is to keep your hands clean, keep, keep washing your hands, keep good hygiene, wipe down surfaces, and keep two meters apart. And where you can socially distance, you should be safe. I mean, that's the whole point of social distancing. The, the, the transmission over that, over that uh, distance uh, sh shouldn't be able to happen. So that becomes your defense mechanism. Once you get in a treatment room, your social distancing is impossible to maintain. And so we have to substitute social distancing at that point with PPE, personal protective equipment. And um, in particular, we're gonna focus on, uh, on laser and IPL treatments, obviously. There are other treatments I understand people will do, but this is, is very focused on laser and IPL treatments and calls upon um, some of the work done by the British Medical Laser Association that looks specifically at the hazards uh, caused by those treatments and how to mitigate the risks using PPE. So this is the what we would call the reopening checklist. It goes hand in hand with the uh, risk assessment. But this is giving you really some, some great guidance. You know, as the name suggests, it's like a checklist. Have I, have I put the hand sanitizer up? Yeah, tick. Have I, you know, this is what we're going to go through now. Uh, and I think this is where we'll jump into this uh, new document. Maybe I'll just stop that chair. Okay, so this is, um, I mean, it, if you go through sort of all the individual bullet points in here, it is very similar to your risk assessment. Um, it just puts it into a format, which hopefully then becomes quite a nice checklist for you to use and also allows you to kind of just reword it a little bit and actually produce your policies and your procedures from it as well. So it should just be a bit, you know, ho we're hoping it's a time saving tool for you as much as anything in terms of being able to just roll out your policies and procedures for it. But um, I mean, it gives you a, an, an introduction to um, reopening. Um, we'd like to take the time to just thank the JCCP. Um, if you haven't done so already, there's a, a link to their guidelines within this document. And they're really thorough and really good. So we'd advise anyone to go and have a read of those as well. And um, we're going to point you a couple of times in the direction of Consulting Room. They have an online portal with some really good resources. Uh, and then we're going to talk through the BMLA guidelines on laser plume and laser specific treatments as well. So those, you know, the documents from these um, advisors have been really useful for us in putting together the, these documents. Um, OK, so you've got your five point checklist in here, as John mentioned earlier, and the risk assessment just mentioned up here. And then this document goes on to go through your general hazards. And what we've tried to do where possible is put links in to some um, extra resources. So, you know, one of your general hazards, you know, as John mentioned, the very best thing that you can be doing is have everyone in the business regularly washing their hands with soap and water. Um, but you will need to train your team in effective hand washing. 
and you'll need to have posters up around the business that talk about how to wash hands. So we've just, wherever possible, we've tried to put some links in um, that just tell you, you know, places that you can go to get these posters easily downloadable, how to dispose of tissues, etc. Um, and, and, and so on, really. And as you can see down the side um, on the left here, we go through each specific area of the business. So the reception, waiting areas, toilets, bathrooms, etc., onto the treatment room, room itself. So at this point, it, it, it might be a good idea to start sort of taking those questions, John, and just kind of going through the nitty gritty of things that people yeah, are. Yeah, I've got some questions here. Can I just mention the hand washing now? It's a bit of a thing. I stood up at LinkedIn and said this as well, because I have to say, uh, as a physicist, I was a bit naive to the uh, skills of hand washing because um, it, it seemed trivial to me. You know, what's a big deal about washing your hands? So uh, because we do surgical lasers, um, at some point, I had to go on a, a course to um, get qualified to go into operating theatres in the NHS. Uh, and you have to learn sort of what you can touch, what you can't touch. And, and one of the things we did, we spent an entire morning on how to wash your hands. And um, the, it starts off with just simply asking us to go and wash our hands and come back into the room. And we put like a substance onto our skin and we put our hands under a UV lamp. And, and they, we could tell where we hadn't washed our hands sufficiently. And it was, it was amazing. I'd washed my hands, what I considered to be very thoroughly, yet there was, there was stuff all over my hands that hadn't been washed off. And that you could see it under the UV lamp. And then we spent the morning learning how to wash our hands. If you're medically trained, this is probably, uh, you know, second nature to you. But, but as a non-medic, I was astounded, really. And once you follow the correct hand washing procedure, you have, you, we did it again, we did the correct hand washing procedure, went back on the lamp, very, very clean hands. It's amazing how it, it just worth two minutes to go online and check the NHS web, website. They have a great video of how to wash your hands properly. And I would advise all people to, even, I know some great practitioners who, who aren't from a medical background, who, aren't nece who wouldn't necessarily, I don't think, know precisely how to do that. In terms of questions that we've got so far, um, I mean, good one from uh, Kay Bell, but if, um, you know, if we've already got procedures in place here for, for example, how do I sterilize my lumina blocks uh, and we deem that to be okay, in the risk assessment, how is that handled? And I think the answer probably is that if you look in the risk assessment titles, it does state, you know, what's the hazard? What am I currently doing about it? Do I need to do anything additional? And I think if you, you're, if you satisfy yourself that what you're doing already is fine, then, then the answer is no, I don't need to do anything additional. This is covered already. Um, yeah, I'd just say that you want to consider like if it's just the block, just maybe think about going a little bit further. You know, have you mentioned the touch screen in there? Have you mentioned the cables running back? You know, because you may be using two hands on your one hand on your handpiece, one on your cable, etc. Um, so just just revisit your existing policies and just check that you're happy with them. I think the other thing then was, is there any way you should screen people coming in for COVID, particularly use of, say, infrared thermometers? Uh, yes, so, yeah, screening, definitely. Um, so, so, I mean, John, we were talking about this earlier, John, the, the two biggest things you can do are screen people and wash hands isn't it? That if, if you're doing those two things, then you are significantly reducing your risk. Um, if you're screening people before they come in, you're, you're automatically reducing the chances of treating somebody with COVID-19. And washing your hands is obviously a significant factor as well. Um, so in terms of screening, um, then N8, in this um, Word document, we have put in a link to the NHS website, which goes through suggested um, symptoms. So you could use that as a basis for a screening questionnaire. Um, but also the JCCP have um, put together a series of screening questions as well in their guidelines. So we've just put a link in there to refer to those as well. So we'd highly recommend screening yeah, before they come in. Now with the thermometers, um, the JCCP have actually um, said that um, it's not advisable to use thermometers um, because um, you, you know, obviously people can be asymptomatic. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. A any screening process can't, will, will, there's always flaws in it, isn't there? But at least it's a, a first port of call. Try not to treat anyone who's obviously COVID positive. But, you, know, you, you clearly wouldn't do that knowingly, but there could be a possibility that you, you didn't realise. In, in fact, the client themselves didn't realise. So that's where the second line of defence comes in, and that's, that's everything you're implementing here. So what, can we go back to the uh, hand sanitizer? Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what would be your recommendation for uh, people arriving, clients coming into the clinic in terms of hand so, sanitizer? Um, so, um, we are recommending uh, that if you're using hand sanitizers in the business, that they are a minimum of 60%. So ideally over a 60% alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Now you can use a 70% hand sanitizer, but that's going to be pretty harsh on your hands if you're using it very regularly. So effective washing with soap and water is the best thing that you can do for your hands. And then the sanitizer is there as an option for you um, to, to just, you know, use at convenient moments throughout the day but if at any point you are concerned about transmission on your hands washing your hands is the best port of call. I've got an interesting point here on screening I mean a couple of things saying well how, how do we screen people I think, I think there are plenty of documents out there with some suggestions I mean the, the main thing really is to just ask your clients to to declare if there are any symptoms really that they might be suffering from that, that's the main way you can it's very difficult for you to actually screen somebody, uh, you know, in terms of testing or yeah. testing. But here, here's a, a quick, sorry, go on. Yeah, it's, it's likely we'll do a two part screening um, process in our clinic. So we'll do a, um, before someone books in for a virtual consultation, we'll issue the medical history forms and um, a questionnaire. Okay, and as part of that, there'll just be five or six questions, you know, have they had a fever? Have they come into contact with anybody? Just, just guided by the, the NHS and the JCPs guidelines. And then in addition to that, so we might go on then and do a virtual consultation with someone. In addition to that, the day before um, people are due to come to clinic, it is advisable to just give them a ring round, ring round and just verbally run through those questions. So if you remember, we were doing this before we went into lockdown, so a similar similar procedure to that. Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, there's a question here about, so if you had a client who you knew was working in the NHS with COVID patients, uh, but fully protected as, as they should be, I mean, would you take any extra precautions like asking them to quarantine for two weeks? It's one of the questions that's, that's come up here. I don't think I've come across any guidance on that so far. I don't know if you have, John. I, don't know. I think my, my view would be, I mean, it's very difficult to ask somebody to self-quarantine themselves uh, if they were willing to do that. I don't, you know, clearly there would be no harm in that, but I, I find that difficult to ask them, particularly if they're going to have a sequence of treatments. They can't, can't do that each time. I think you just have to take your own precautions, which we're going to come on to now, uh, about how you would manage the treatment yourself. And I think you've just got to be, have a good relationship with them, talk to them about what, how they see that risk. You know, they're, they, they're managing that risk every day. They understand that far better than we do. And I think if they have to be confident themselves that they're not COVID positive, because they don't want to put people, other people at risk either. I think if you know your client well, I would talk to them on a personal basis about that really. Um, so Kerry's just asking how we send those questionnaires. So um, we use actually a, a package in our clinic called Avartu that allows us to issue forms digitally and store the responses um, online. Um, so um, we put some recommendations in here. Uh, DocuSign is a very good platform for um, securing uh, getting you know nice secure GDPR compliant forms filled in online that there's actually a huge amount of resources that you can use to go paperless in your clinic uh, and issue all the forms and store all the forms on the cloud the only thing we would do is just have 
suggest that you have a look at you know what are the requirements in your business what sorts of things do you want to do you know will you be do issuing form will you be going completely paperless will there be some things that you want to keep on paper um you know how will you how will you be doing your virtual consultations your video consultations and if you if you don't already have a package in place with all of these features in it maybe now's a good time to shop around and have a look for them um, and you can ask those questions in doing so is it encrypted end to end so we would recommend going for packages that are encrypted things like microsoft teams is very good for that in terms of um, security on your video consults and um, then gdpr compliant as well so just just checking that it's legally robust um, and that it's encrypted is, is is best practice really yeah um it's probably worth saying isn't it we're, we're planning to introduce video consults i mean i guess most people are but that might not be a given uh, but i think try and minimize the time that clients spend in the clinic so consultations can be done now remotely we're looking at even setting up the um, consultation forms and the consent form that can be done by email. So that's where you need the DocuSign software or something similar. That's a software that legally um, allows people to sign documents remotely. So it's not sort of a wet signature anymore with, with a pen. Uh, and, and that's our plan so that we don't have to have all that part of the, the client journey face to face, you know, that's a, that's a remote set. And then when people come into clinic, of course, you know, even if they can pay by credit card or the phone beforehand, even that's taken care of. If not, contactless payments, they're, they're what we would be looking for. When people arrive at clinic, minimize their baggage, they don't want accessories, don't want to come in with all the shopping bags, you know, leave all that in the car. We, we plan to leave people waiting until the point where the treatment room is ready. We'll meet them at the door, take them straight through to the treatment room. And that's where I think we'll lead to with our next part of the discussion now is on what happens inside that treatment room. Is that, is that okay? Is there anything else? Yeah, just, just um, Kerry was asking, when, when do you think you'll be doing this? Um, well, essentially it's sort of already done, Kerry. It depends on what platform you want to use. So whichever platform you're using, you just take the questions from our, cons our medical history and consent form and you adapt them to the platform you've got. So for DocuSign, for example, you can upload a PDF of our consultation form and you can, you can literally click and put boxes to say, fill this in, sign here, make this a drop down list, etc. So it, it it, we can't necessarily create the digital form. I don't think that will be suitable for everybody to use, but we certainly have all the questions there. And then whichever platform you're using, you know, you can adapt it to suit. Okay. Shall I talk a bit about then, we're going to the treatment room now and, and the situation in the treatment room, I think. Do you want me to look at your document first, Hayley, and then we'll jump back into the presentation. I can go through a bit more detail. That sounds sensible. Mm -hmm. So on that, I noticed um, someone suggested, you know, what about non-alcoholic hand sanitizers? Well, um, we've been recommending the alcohol-based hand sanitizers just, just based on government guidance, really. Uh, but I do know we were chatting to Andy Berry earlier and he's got some non-alcohol based uh, viral wipes uh, which uh, are used regularly in the NHS actually. So um, I certainly think there's absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. You've just got to check really with whatever the supply is, is it, is it designed to kill viruses? But what's frustrates me no end is uh, I've seen so many people selling hand sanitizers that are uh, based for bacterial uh, infections, so you know, it kills 99% of bacteria dead. I wouldn't say anything about viruses. I'm not an expert in hand sanitizers, but I'd like to see the words that it kills viruses on, on my hand sanitizer, whether it be alcohol based or not. So I think that's the key thing, really. Just check, just, just check if it's designed to destroy viruses. Okay, so if we step into the treatment room, I guess what are the main uh, hazards and risks? Because at this point now, we're coming into much closer contact with the client, aren't we, Hayley? And that's 
where unfortunately all the hard work we've done outside the treatment of social distancing is now impossible to maintain. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at implementing uh, different mechanisms to reduce risk. And they're largely based on, on uh, protective equipment, aren't they, PPE? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously decontamination of your treatment room in between patients is really important. So things like making sure you've got enough time in between patients to do a thorough clean down um, is really essential. It is ideal if you have a sink in your treatment room because you're going to keep your PPE in your treatment room and you want to wash your hands immediately before that PPE goes on. If you're not able to do that, then obviously you can use a hand sanitizer, but if there is any way to have a sink in there, then, then that's the best situation. Um, opening windows in the intervals between treatments and making sure that air conditioning doesn't just recirculate air into other rooms in the establishment. And this is particularly important, isn't it, John, for um, aerosol generating procedures, so AGPs. Yeah, um, we'll certainly come on to that. When we jump back onto the slides, I'd like to talk a bit more about some of the background with laser treatments. But, but just to be clear to everybody that um, the BMLA guidance states that all laser treatments uh, can potentially produce aerosol or plume, uh, or aerosol in a plume. And so we have to consider, um, I mean, do you want me to jump out and have a look at that first, Helen? Cover that now, yeah. Might be yeah. worth it. So, let me go back to okay so talked a lot about the reception and waiting areas toilets and bathrooms I guess didn't mention that but very briefly obviously uh, you know um, it's a place of potential contamination so if you are going to allow clients to use toilets and bathrooms you're going to have to decontaminate wipe down afterwards and there may be other areas as well. These are all covered in the uh, uh, checklist document we've produced. I think the, the issue that I want to just touch on now and give you a bit of background and we'll go, we'll go back to the document is this idea that when we get into the treatment room, we lose a lot of our ability to protect ourselves through social distancing. You know, laser and IPL, uh, it's an up-close treatment and suddenly we're in an area of higher risk um, in, in the NHS, um, they, they have the term sort of hot COVID zones and cold COVID zones. And this would be considered a hot COVID zone uh, under these circumstances. I mean, ideally, if you can do this, everywhere outside the treatment room, uh, you use social distancing as a technique of protecting you, and you call it cold, a cold COVID zone. And it's only when you take, get into the treatment room that changes. And you want to try and minimise contamination risk. So people coming out of this treatment room, you have to really guide them straight out the door and out of the clinic. So there's, there's reduced risk of contamination, what we call a cold zone. Well, let's focus on the uh, treatment now and um, think very much about laser treatment specifically. So I think everyone will be familiar that certain laser treatments like uh, CO2 treatments produce what we call a plume. So when you're lasering, uh, particles, certainly with CO2, it's an ablative treatment. Uh, we know it generates particles of tissue that get, get projected off, off the skin. People who do tattoo removal might be familiar. Sometimes you get a splatter and some pinpoint bleeding, so clearly there's, there's issues there. And when you do laser hair removal, of course, um, you know, you smell the burning hair. I've heard some practitioners say, great, great result, I can smell the hair burning. You know, all of these things are because the laser has generated a plume and, and particles have come off the skin and are now floating around inside the room. Now, there's very good evidence that lasers, when you laser skin and a plume is generated, they also generate an aerosol at the same time. An aerosol is just very, very tiny particles, so, so small you can't actually see them. So you can't see aerosol, but it exists. And we also know that COVID is transmitted predominantly through aerosol. So it's carried by aerosol through the air and then it's breathed in or is it or is brought into your system. And that's a big mechanism for transmission of COVID. The real question then is, um, you know, well, in that case, when we ablate, ablate the skin, when we laser, we create this, this aerosol uh, in the plume, it, is it going to be carrying any COVID virus? And I think, the, the, the 
honest answer to that is we, we just don't know at this stage, but there is a risk that it could carry COVID virus. I mean, in particular, you can imagine a scenario where, you know, on the way into the clinic, someone sneezed, wiped the hands or their arm, you come to laser, and even if that was the infection method, there's a risk that they could be carrying COVID. And so we, we have to assume at this point in time that that aerosol generated plume from the laser treatment is a hazard to us. Is it carries a risk of COVID transmission. And it's a higher risk than just, you know, social distancing can cover on its own. We have to implement uh, PPE to protect ourselves from, from that risk. Um, it's also worth pointing out, you know, you might say, well, I do uh, vascular lesions. I can't imagine how that treatment is going to create a plume. But, well, it's true. We're not intentionally creating any aerosol or plume during treatment like vascular. But it would be impossible to say that we wouldn't inadvertently you know, hit a hair follicle or somehow some target in the skin that might generate a plume. We have to assume, and the British Medical Laser Association have published their guidance on this now, we have to assume two things. One, that all laser treatments and IPL treatments have a risk of generating a plume and that that plume may contain COVID. Okay? So we have to make those assumptions and move forwards from that situation. So how do we protect ourselves against that? Well, any transmission then of COVID uh, in that situation can be prevented or the risk minimized with uh, preventive, uh, with PPE. Should point out, I forgot to mention earlier, we, we are advising then that all patients on entrance to a clinic or clients when they come into a clinic should be given a surgical mask to wear. So a surgical mask is you know, the type of thing that people wear in operating theatres. They've been designed to protect uh, you know, someone that the surgeon is operating on from transmission of any infection from the surgeon to the patient. So if you hand over a, 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 a surgical mask to your clients as they walk through the door, I think it does two things. One, it gives them a sense of security and they feel better about it. You put on the mask, see you taking it seriously. And the reality is that surgical mask protects you, and your team, from that client. Okay, those masks are not designed to stop COVID getting in, in, in through them. They're designed to stop something coming out. Okay, so the surgical mask gives you an element of protection, but largely just from coughing, sneezing, talking. Okay, so it reduces the risk immediately to reception, to anyone they, they meet in corridors. And then when you're in the treatment room, if they can continue to wear the mask during the treatment, they should. It reduces any risk you might have. So if you're doing hair removal, you're doing body treatments, that's fine. They can wear the mask. And under those circumstances, the biggest risk then of transmission is through the laser plume. And so to minimise that risk to yourself, uh, the BMLA, the British Medical Laser Association, recommend that operators should wear what they call an FFP2 um, a lot of people call them masks, but technically they're called respirators. So they look like those DIY masks, if you're not familiar, white, you know, elastic round. Some of them have small uh, sort of valves on, on the outside as well. So they're, a lot of people call them FFP2 masks or N95. That's a, uh, a different standard, but the same, same level of quality. And so for any treatments that aren't on the face, essentially, we would be recommending, along with the BMI guidance, that you wear as a practitioner an FFP2 rated mask or respirator. To reduce that risk even further, and I would recommend this mainly if you're doing things like tattoo removal, hair removal, or, or CO2 treatments, where, you, where you're definitely going to be generating plume, then I think putting a smoke evacuator in is very sensible. Smoke evacuator systems are devices that suck away the, the plume and the smoke. They're regularly used actually in certain laser surgery and certainly with most CO2 lasers we sell, people will take a, a smoke evacuator because we know that the HP uh, virus can be, can be transmitted through skin particles that come off during CO2 treatment. So, so in actual fact, uh, we, would, um, we, would make, we, we would recommend a, a smoke evacuator for CO2 anyway. Under these circumstances, we try and do the same thing. Uh, and in fact, we've recently, uh, we've put together a package actually on smoke evacuation. Now, I think that's available. I think it's on our website. You can get a smoke evacuator. The key to this 
is that it needs an ultra filter. Well, the HEPA filters uh, suggested that it can be uh, good enough to filter out viruses. Corona happens to be a very small virus, very small in size, so we're recommending the ultra filters should be used in any smoke evacuators. Um, obviously, you do the treatment, or the plume flies around the room, and you then need to try and get rid of as much of that in between treatments. So once you've finished the treatment, decontaminate surfaces, what wipe them down. Uh, again, recommending alcohol, alcohol wipes. Now, unlike your hands, the alcohol wipes can be as strong as, as you can possibly get them, really. I think the ones we've been using are about 98% alcohol. Um, but the only reason we won't use that on our hands is it'll do, it's awful for your skin and having if you use that for a couple of weeks, you, you'd, uh, your skin would be terrible on your hands. So that's why people recommend you know 60% or above. But obviously when you're cleaning a surface, the, the more alcohol, the better really. Um, and then just ventilate your room, try and get rid of the plume, try and get rid of this contaminant between treatments. So we're recommending, along with the BMLA, that you leave time between treatments to ventilate your room as best you can. If you've got windows, get them open. As Hayley said, um, if you've got air conditioning systems, make sure they're set to an extract so they suck air out of the room into the, the outside world. If, if you're unfortunately in a situation where that's difficult to do, you just got to simply try and open your door. You can buy, I understand, sort of purification systems. I don't know whether they're uh, entirely suitable but certainly something to try and vent the room would be important here. That's great until we say, okay, well, what are we going to do for facial treatments? I've given this mask, the surgical mask to uh, my client who's come in. That's protecting me. I can wear an FFP2 mask. I know that, you know, in confidence, you should be okay with all of this. I'm doing body treatments, doing hair, no problem. When I come to do the face, though, it's likely that I might need them to remove their mask. And the British Medical Aid guidance um, doesn't, doesn't stop that from happening. It's, it, it allows people to say, yep, yeah, of course, if you're doing a treatment like that, you, you may need to ask your client to remove their mask. And under those circumstances, two things occur. One, you are now slightly more exposed because you've taken away one of your mechanisms of defense against transmission, reducing the risk. The second thing is, if you're treating around the facial area, this is where it's more highly probable or, or the risk is, is heightened that if they were COVID positive, that the infection risk is predominant from the respiratory tract, from the mouth, from the nose, and that, that could have contaminated some of the skin area. Of course, with all treatments, you cleanse the skin first, that's fine, but there's still a bigger risk. Any treatments, and, and the BMLA state it as this, any treatments above the clavicle, so above the, the collarbone essentially, then you should upgrade your own defense, your own protection, and you should use an FFP3 mask or an N99 mask, or a respirator, I should say. Really. Just to be clear, the difference between these two, they're, they're standard uh, ratings for respirators or masks, and the difference is just how, what, to what percent they filter out these very tiny particles. Uh, and FFP2, FFP3, you'll have heard a lot about, I'm sure, they're just different ratings of the respirator. I think the BMLA and Minton were conscious that it's not always going to be easy to get hold of these, um, this PPE, these masks, and certainly FFP3 masks are expensive, or relatively expensive. So we do, I think that's the point the BMLA was making here, that if you're not doing the face area, if, you, if people are keeping this mask on, then the FFP2 should be fine cheaper, it's easier to get hold of. It's only when you're at high risk that you need to upgrade your protection. And with all of this, BMI recommends a face shield as well, uh, one, either a disposable one or a, a washable one. So they can be bought and reused and just cleaned between treatments. I mean, certainly things like um, tattoo removal where there's risk of uh, you know, blood being released and, and splatter and a face shield is definitely uh, vital really in that, in that sort of situation. I guess I'll finish on this line and perhaps put to questions, shall I? Sure. Yeah. But, um, that's the main risk or the main hazard that's been, been, um, been identified really by the British Medical Aids Association 
for laser treatments is this idea of clean generation. How do we, how do we mit mitigate the risk as much as possible? But there is physical transmission. You know, you're touching a client with a laser with a quartz light guide if you've got an IPL, and you then don't want that to be transmitted on, on pre, you know, onto the next patient. Well, it, most of, um, I mean, most manufacturers will give uh, instruction on how to sterilize between clients, and that should already automatically be in viral transmission. So I don't think there's going to be much change here, but we're just looking at um, alcohol wipes, at least 70%, if not stronger, and you just want to clean down your equipment between, between uh, patients, between clients. I would extend that though. I would wipe down the entire laser screen, touch screen, body of the laser, clean the bit that's touched the patient, obviously, and just generally try and decontaminate the room as much as possible between each, each client. Before we move on to the last section, do, do you want to cut back to either your document or at least questions on that? Or... Well, we've got lots of questions. Um, so, I mean, we've We've only got one extra part to cover now, so maybe we should do that and just go to open Q&A. Yeah, sounds good. So this is our checklist. We've done our risk assessment. We've now got hold of uh, the Linton guidance document. That's helped us with cleaning, hand washing, hygiene procedures, social distancing in, in the reception areas. We get in the treatment room. We've got to take additional uh, precautions through PPE. And we've described what is the hazard there. It's mainly the laser plume. And that's what we're trying to, to reduce the risk of with the PPE we are uh, wearing. But, but also, of course, just the patient themselves or the client themselves, we're mitigating most risk with, with giving them a mask. I think the last thing you will have to do, and the government recommend this still, is if you could work from home, you should work from home at this point in time. Um, I take maybe the assumption with it, obviously as a practitioner, that's not going to work when you come to do a treatment. You need to be... Uh, there in the room with people. But like Hayley mentioned earlier, you know, virtual consultations could be done from anywhere. You might have, depends how big your clinic is, what sort of team you have behind you, if you've got marketing people, perhaps they could work from home, and if so, set up some home working. At the very least, have that conversation with your, yourself and your team. Can people work from home appropriately? And if they can't, okay, everything else is covered. But have that conversation, tick that box, and then you have gone through a five-step plan that was recommended by government for opening your business back up. Okay. And I think that covers everything then that you, you need to cover. Yeah, I think if we did questions, there are some last few slides are just pointers really, which we perhaps finish off with of, of some good other, other sources of good information. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, Manjit has a, a question. Um, her most popular treatments at the moment are full face followed by full body. And I'm, I make the assumption that's laser hair removal because um, I know you have a, a motus, I think. So um, the first requires me to be close to the client's face. The latter requires me um, to be with them for two hours plus. So in our guidance, we are recommending um, that treatments uh, last for no longer than an hour. And the reason for that is because it's one of the issues with the transmission is transmission load. So it's the amount of time that you are exposed to someone. You know, if you did happen to have someone um, who was unaware that they were, um, that they had COVID-19 and they were in for a 15 minute, 30 minute treatment with you, that's one thing. But if they're in the room with you for three hours, your risk is significantly higher. So you will need to look at reducing your treatment downs, treatment times down to an hour max. And she's afraid of not looking like Darth Vader. Unfortunately, I think we're all going to look a little bit odd uh, when we go back. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's not a lot to be done about that. I mean, I think it is going to be a bit uncomfortable you know you might not want to order anything in bulk at this time maybe just get a few uh, masks get a few visors see how the fit is for you because the fit of this PPE is really important uh, we'll, we'll perhaps come on to, to mention that um, 
so yeah maybe just don't go out and bulk buy anything too much at the moment because you you know you want to make sure you're you're as comfortable as you can be in this ppe it's a really good question and, and how will the client you know feel being faced by this and that's a difficult thing to answer but i can assure you that, that the entire world will be will be there's a culture change isn't there everybody's got to get used to this if you go to the dentist they will look equally as PPE'd up as we would as, as we would in clinics. So, you know, people will get used to this. It's not ideal, of course it's not, but it, but, it, but I think your clients will completely understand and be accepting of it and the difficulties that come along with it, you know, in communication. I mean someone's just said here as well, you know, if I'm wearing these masks and I can't spell burning burning hair, you know, how will I know if my patch test is working well? So I'm not, I mean I know in the past I've heard people suggest that, you know, if I can smell burning hair, then that's a, that's a good thing. I mean, you shouldn't be smelling burning hair, really. That's the, that's the one thing that we've got to change. I don't think it's the absolute indicator of a perfect patch test. There are other things you should be looking for or seeing from a patch test. Um, as we move forward, you know, I mean, this isn't just about COVID, but plume in general is not good to be breathing in. And if you can smell burning hair, you're breathing in particles. You know, and so as we as we move forward, I think one thing we'll learn from this COVID uh, pandemic is just a little bit more thought about our safety in clinics in terms of things like the dangers associated with plume. So my advice on the, the burning hair is that has to be something we stop wanting to smell going forward. You know, what would you do for beds, Haley? How would you decontaminate a bed, or what would you cover them with? Uh, yeah, so disposable covers will be great, but they'll need to be disposed of um, uh, as, as clinical waste. Um, and uh, if not, then yeah, just wiping down as per your usual decontamination of the treatment room after the treatment. So a couple more questions here. Uh, what, one is about the masks. Can you wear them for longer than one patient? Can you use them for longer? Yes. So the JCCP guidelines um, have given us some, some guidance, I guess, on this. Um, and they've advised that they can be sessional. So that would be a morning or an afternoon. So, you know, th three hours, three and a half hours, something like that. Yeah. My, my understanding is, and I've not, I've not been in treatment with one of these masks on three and a half hours, but, you know, they're not, it's not comfortable to do that. That that's can be difficult. But, but, but yes, you can, you can wear them from patient to patient at the very least. Um, and there's no absolute, we can't give you a, a time, you know, it's, it's difficult to say precisely you can use them for this, but sessional is the word that people use, isn't it? So, um, what about uh, smoke evacuators? I uh, mentioned we, someone's saying, where, you know, where could we get one from? How long do the filters last? Yeah, well, I guess the, the big question that a lot of people are going to have about smoke evacuators is, do I have to do this? You know, you kind of look at, you've got to look at your situation and say what is feasible for you to do. You know, if it, it's not a legal requirement that you have a smoke evacuator, but it is something that you should consider um, because it is going to help reduce risk. Certainly if you are doing, you know, quite you know, a long appointment of laser hair, for example, as John said, or tattoo. Um, we do recommend looking for the ultra particulate filters, not just the HEPA filters. Um, and we have um, sourced an option um, that is a surgical smoke evacuator with adequate filters in um, for virus like COVID-19. And that is um, available to view on our website. And because it's a surgical smoke, ev smoke evacuator, it's, it's £3,000. So they're not cheap but they will make a significant difference to your risk of transmission. So the one that we've sourced, um, we, we know is from a very reputable company. It's medically CE marked um, and the filters do filter out what they need to. So that is a very safe bet. Yeah, we first came across this in our surgical field, didn't we? And it's been used for many years in the NHS, this product for surgical laser plumes and laser plumes in the NHS. So I, I yeah, I highly recommend it. It's a decent, decent smoke evacuator. Can I mention the smoke evacuation? It's really critical. I, I think on the coffee morning, I had a customer who tried one and was disappointed with how well it sort of removed the plume. So I looked into this and um, there's actually some good published papers on 
the sensitivity. You need to get your smoke evacuated pretty up close to the treatment site and it will be very effective at sucking away plume. But move back just a few centimetres uh, and, and the suction ability reduces quite dramatically. So you do need to have it pretty close to the, the working site. But if you do that, they're very effective. And, and as I say, they've been used for years in, in surgery. Mm. So I was asking about cryo coolers and blowing, blowing cold air. I know that the BMLA are recommending at least temporarily not to use them where possible, simply because they would disperse the, uh, the plume around the room rather than you, you try to control the spread of this particulate matter in the air. So you try to suck it away or at the very least you're protecting yourself from breathing it in. If you start blowing, using your crayons to blow cold air on the skin, it could circulate it around the room. So if you yeah. can, try and use alternative methods really for cooling. Don't want anything really that has that air pressure motion. Um, so that would be things like hand dryers as well. So disconnect your hand dryers in your toilets. Yeah. Uh, again, these are things written, written into the guides um, that we've created. So disconnect those. Don't use the, the cryo coolers and no fans in your rooms either. Yeah. Please remember as well, I mean, we don't know how long this will or last. These are measures you put in place for now. But, you know, my assumption is further down the line, things will change again, we'll, uh, things will improve. I'm not suggesting you need to throw your crowd coolers away. I would certainly keep hold of it and use it where it's appropriate uh, in other treatments, for example, because, you know, ultimately I imagine we'll be using those again. They're an excellent system for cooling the skin, just temporarily and not ideal in these circumstances. Talking about whether you should wear goggles that seal over your eyes or a visor sufficient. Yeah, so visors are sufficient. We're happy with visors, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I think we looked into this and obviously, you know, in all the laser treatment, you're gonna to have to wear goggles to protect your eyes from laser. Uh, not some of those are glassy style rather than goggle style. But that's the point of the visor, really. I think with a visor, a mask, and your laser goggles, it's absolutely fine. You don't need goggles that literally seal around your face. I don't think that's required at all. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not talked about aprons, but there's a question here about plastic disposable aprons. Are they good enough, or do you need complete overalls or, or you know, like scrubs, for example? Um, yeah, so there's, there's, I've actually struggled to find sort of confirmation on that one way or the other. Um, and so we are recommending a disposable apron alongside a clothes washing procedure. So our recommendation is that the, that, that somebody will arrive to the clinic to, you know, the practitioner will arrive at the clinic not wearing their uniform they'll change into their uniform in a, a separate changing facility which you'll set up maybe in a spare treatment room or a, a zone within the clinic operate for the day in that uniform with disposable aprons for each person and at the end of the day that uniform will be changed out of the operator won't go home in it it will either go into a, a double plastic bag um, and be taken home to be laundered or if possible laundered at the clinic and you should wear gloves and masks just surgical masks when you put that into the laundry and uh, wash it at 60 degrees. Yeah um, another a question here that I think just worth clarifying the, the question is can you confirm is it FFP2, FFP, FFP3 masks for close proximity treatments but surgical masks for all other? Now from my point of view, what we've been talking about largely here is laser treatment. And the FFP2 and FFP3 are for any laser treatment. It just depends where you're doing it on the body. Basically, if it's below the neck, you can wear an FFP2. If it's above the neck, you should wear an FFP3. That's the guidance from the British Medical Laser Association. Now, surgical masks are given to your clients. Your clients can wear the surgical mask where possible. That gives you an extra layer of, uh, or reduces risk of transmission just from the client themselves. Uh, if we step beyond just laser treatments, and I've looked mainly at just laser treatments, and that's certainly what, what I'm recommending here. What's your, you've read around a bit more of other treatments, Hayley. Would you need that level of protection for other treatments? Um, yes, we are, we are recommending that. We're recommending FFP2 
um, for if you were doing, say, for example, a radio frequency treatment on the body, um, FFP2. Yeah, that's the recommendation. Now that there's some leniency in this in various documents, you know, there's disclaimers. If you cannot get that um, mask, then you go with the next best option. And that really, I guess, is applicable to anything in any of these guidance documents. If you don't have air conditioning, you go with the next best option of opening the windows. If you can't open the window, you go with the next best option of, um, you know, alternating between treatment rooms or leaving a larger gap between one treatment and the next treatment. So you, you should take all of this guidance as what can I do? What can I get hold of? And um, it wouldn't necessarily, they don't necessarily stop you operating, you just have to adapt how you're operating. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting, you know, you don't need an FFP2 mask to walk around the supermarket and you might argue that sometimes you come real close to people, but you only come close to them for 10 seconds as you walk past or you bump into them at the end of the aisle. You're in a room now for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes with a client. And remember at the start we said it's, it's not just proximity, it's proximity and time. And that's why we'd recommend trying to use FFP2 mask because you have a higher risk when you're in a small confined space with one person, assuming they're COVID positive, for, uh, for 40 minutes. It's much higher risk than just walking past somebody in the supermarket. So, you know, you can go to the supermarket just wearing a surgical mask or a homemade mask. Uh, and that's what the government recommends. I would say you need to upgrade that as a practitioner when you're in a treatment room and so on for an hour. You know, that's why we're saying it should be an FFP2 mask. I suppose irrespective of treatment, the, the BMLA is upgrading that just because of some higher risks associated specifically with laser treatment and flu. Um, I think that's the main questions on the question and answer. Are there any guidelines for, for HEPA for hair removal? I assume that means filters in the smoke evacuators. Yeah. So essentially, I think we said earlier, we, we, we'd recommend an ultra HEPA filter, even for, for laser hair removal, actually. And which variety of masks have we, are we using? I think at the moment, we, we've no particular brand. We've just got some FFP2 masks and FFP3 masks. Uh, we are looking at them now, and I know that Haley, in the uh, information we're making available, is pointing to some reputable suppliers, so you'd be able to look at what they're offering, uh, and um, you know, base, you know, find the products you need from suppliers. But we're not, we're not supplying masks. I think there's a lot of good companies out there that can do so. Uh, and uh, I think we've linked to some of them, haven't we? We have, yeah. So we've um, we've advised you to sort of say in your policies and your procedures that where possible you'll get medically CE marked PPE. Um, however, when that is not available, you will make sure that you look for a reputable supplier. And then there's a, a link that we've included to that reputable supplier so that you can show that you've done your due diligence really with sourcing the best possible PPE. Um, and that link will take you into a portal um, which is called relaunch and that's from consulting room um, and it's a brilliant portal so definitely go in and have a, a look in there there's loads of help and advice and guidance posters to put around your clinic and videos to watch etc about how to put PPE on and off um, so so that that document that portal is referenced a few times in our document and that's where we're recommending you go to find various reputable reputable suppliers of all of this PPE so everything from your aprons to your surgical masks for your clients to your FFP2s and your FFP3s your visors uh, for yourselves. Yeah someone's mentioned a great point here that these FFP masks are difficult to get hold of and really should be directed to NHS frontline staff. I would wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree with that, but I am aware now that the, the, the NHS, as far as um, I understand at least is well stocked now, and I don't think, it, if you can get the masks from a legitimate source, if I mean, one thing you can always ask is, you know, 
is there enough supply for the NHS? And if there is, I'd like to buy what, whatever else you've got, something. I know that people have been saying that to suppliers. So if you have a moral issue about that, just check with your supplier that they have sufficient stock to provide the NHS. And my understanding at the moment is, as we've passed over the peak now, the NHS uh, isn't struggling to get on these masks. So if you can find suppliers with a surplus stock, then there's anything wrong with that. We've been able to source both types of masks uh, and uh, not really had too much issue with that. There's one other point which raised about whether or not um, you can reuse the masks. And um, certainly FFP3 masks uh, can be relatively expensive. Um, the, there is some guidance in the British Medical Aid Association guidelines from another source actually. And essentially the suggestion is if you, you can avoid reusing them, that's probably better, but there are me mechanisms you can implement that means you can reuse them over again. One example is, it's fairly well known that the coronavirus uh, can't exist outside the body for more than 72 hours. So if you were to cycle your masks round, uh, once you'd used them, put them to one side, seal them up, leave them for over 72 hours, then logically the virus, if there wasn't any virus trapped in the mask, it would, it would then die and you could use it again. I think it's a bit of a risky strategy you don't want to get confused and pick up the wrong mask. And you'd have to have a sequence of masks and just rotate them around. But if you thought you could handle that and put in a sufficiently robust system, then there is a suggestion that that's possible. Uh, although I think you've just got to decide whether that, in your own risk assessment, whether you can uh, put them in place or not. Someone's asking Hayley about, are clinics generally thinking of passing the cost of these additional uh, PP accessories onto their clients or absorbing it in themselves? I've seen about 50-50 to be honest, um, about 50% about of clinics saying they will pass the cost on and 50% not and we haven't actually, we haven't had a discussion about that ourselves have we John to, no. to decide what we will do. I think that's that just comes down to your margins, can you absorb the cost, you know, do you want, do you want to um, yeah, I, I think that's completely down to your own personal preference. Uh, and just sort of can see some chat here. People talk about KN95 masks versus the FFP. It's a good point. Someone's, someone's clarified that, and I should have should have mentioned FFP is is like a system that's used. I think it's the general European system. There's a KN and an N95. At the N system, I think is American. KN is sort of uh, Chinese. They're all, all the, so KN95 or N95 would be an equivalent to an FFP2 mask and an N99 or KN99 would be the equivalent of an FFP3 mask. And I spoke to someone recently who knows a lot more about this than I do and said, you know, even the, the, the Chinese uh, standard for these masks is very well written and it's very robust. Now, the, the risk might be you know, is it genuinely, is the mask you're buying, if you're buying it in from uh, a source that you're not sure about, does it really meet those requirements? But certainly KN, N or FFP standards are all good and very equivocal. So I don't think it matters whether you get a KN, an N or an FFP. I think all the standards are good. I think what's most important is checking the mask you've bought genuinely conforms to whichever standard that is and isn't just someone stuck on the badge. That makes sense. Mm. Um, so we've had a couple of people just drop in um, some tips of places that they've got their PP from. So we can have a look at these as well. And if we're happy with them, John, we could send out the links to a couple of these suppliers as well, can't they? If people are struggling to to get hold of uh, PP. Yeah, absolutely fine. Yeah. Do you want me to finish off with, um, there's a couple more slides just on here. I think the last thing I was going to do is simply point people to uh, some useful websites. You see these on the screen now. So um, I found this very useful, the JCCP. 
have published um, a sort of overall document for clinics. It's not specifically laser, although it has laser, a laser section in there, uh, but it will cover some of the other treatments people might be considering doing. Very useful, good guidance in that. Um, you mentioned consulting rooms earlier on. Um, the consulting rooms uh, has set up free to access, uh, essentially a, a portal full of great information. Um, it requires you to browse around, to read documents, but, it, but I mean, that is really the way forwards here. There's no, as we said at the start, there's no set manual to this. The best thing you can do is follow guidance and do your homework. And so if you want to do homework, then all the books you're going to need are in the consulting rooms. I like to plug the BNI as well, the British Medical Laser Association. There's no better time to join a community of people. The British Medical Laser Association is very low cost to join. I'm on the executive committee of the British Medical Laser Association. We've obviously, obviously produced a lot of these guidelines. Um, and I think now is a great time. If you're a practitioner working in a small clinic, it's a good community to become part of. So uh, if you have a look at the www.bmla.co.uk, uh, then you, you can find a lot of information about the British Medical Aids Association. And it's accessible for anybody. You don't have to be a medic to join that, that um, uh, association. Our documents will be available from our website, Hayley. Is that correct? Yep. And I do have the email address of everyone that's attended. So I'll email you links as well. I think what we'll do is off the back of some of the questions that we've had, we'll tweak our guidance a little bit so that it just goes through any, um, it just makes it really, really thorough and we can build in some of these things. So try and reflect some of the stuff we've had today. Yeah, so we may spend this evening just, just clarifying a few points and then get them up there for you. Yeah. Okay, I think that concludes really, Haley. if that's good for you. I mean, thank you to everyone for have it join us today and obviously stay safe it's a new adventure for us all as we start to reopen our clinics um, but hopefully what we've put together here uh, is going to be immensely helpful for everybody and we'd love continuous feedback wouldn't we Haley? to yeah definitely on. anything if you get the guides and there's anything that you feel should be added we're we're sort of committed to keeping them regularly up to date so We'll probably put an FAQ section in the back there as well. So any any questions at all, just drop me an email. You've all got my email from the uh, registration uh, approval. So you can drop me a line and we can we can get these updated. Thanks, Haley. That's fantastic. Thank you, John. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks everyone for joining us. No problem. Thanks. <laughs>